Oh, aprende inglés gratis con. Uh, okay, hold on, start that. Let's see, what's it? Ma mansion, man Ma mansion, mansion inglés. Okay, aprende inglés gratis con mansioninglés.com y inglespodcast.com. Hello and welcome, welcome, welcome to Aprender Inglés con Reza y Craig, the award-winning podcast which improves your English and takes it to the next level. I'm Craig. And I'm Reza. Hello. Hello. And we have over 40 years of teaching experience between us. In this episode, we'll be speaking about which is correct, you or I, or you and me. And what's the difference between afterwards and after all. Also, what's the difference between who and whom with an M? When do you use who and when do you use whom? So let's begin with our first question, the difference between after all and afterwards, which I think we may have spoken about before, Reza, but it's a very good question. Um, what do you think? Very good question, yes. I know plenty of native speakers who uh, confuse after and after words. Let me give you uh, a couple of examples that uh, the person who asked this question is Javi, Javi T. And uh, Javier says uh, this example, we are not very good chefs, but after all, the food wasn't that bad. And his second example, we had to study last night, but afterwards we went out for a few beers. They're good examples. They are. Any comments? Yeah. Okay. So as far as I'm concerned... Afterwards is only a time expression. It refers to time. Mm -hmm. After all uh, is more than a time expression. It refers to other things. Uh, let me give me a few of my own examples to add to Javi T's. What about this? I thought I was lost, but I was going the right way after all. Mm -hmm. I wasn't lost. I thought I was lost, but I was going the right way after all. So, ah, no need to worry. So, so okay. perhaps in Spanish, Reza, we could say después de todo? Uh, you could say después de todo. It's, it's good to learn about new technology after all. If we don't learn new things, we don't grow and develop as people. Yep. Yeah. So afterwards would perhaps be después, luego, más tarde? Yes. Or here's another one. Let me help you. After all, you always help me. Mm -hmm. What about that? Yep. There's, a, there's an expression that's, uh, have you heard this, Reza? After all is said and done. Yes. Which perhaps could be al fin y al cabo or a fin de cuentas. Exactly, yeah. After all is said and done, we're happy doing this podcast. Yeah. What about this? After all the trouble she's caused me, I still love Berta. <laughs> Your greyhound. Yeah. After all. Yeah. So, just to recap my examples, I think there's a slight difference between e each of them. Let me re repeat it. I thought I was lost, but I was going the right way after all. In that sentence, we understand, oh, there's no need to worry. I thought I was lost, but I wasn't. No need to worry after all. The next one, let me help you. After all, you always help me. Mm -hmm. It's not the same meaning there, is it? No, it's that not. That after all means like, oh, it's the it's the least I can do. You've done so much for me. Let me help you. It's the least I can do. Yeah. Yeah. I want to repay you in some way. That's Por familiar. lo menos. Por lo menos. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That would be my translation of after all there. Por lo menos. And what about this? After all the trouble she caused me, I still love Berta. After all means después de todo there. Después de todo los problemas. So it it's, can sometimes be translated as después de todo, but not always. Yeah. There are some other uses. Sometimes por lo menos, as you said, and other uses. It's, it's a tricky expression. Mm -hmm. It's tricky. Maybe the best idea is to learn it in context and use it, uh, learn from examples rather than a direct translation. Yeah. But it's more, it's not a time expression. It's more than that. Whereas afterwards is simply a time expression. For yes. example, we had lunch. Afterwards, John went home. Or Razor and I recorded a couple of podcasts and afterwards we had lunch. That was exactly what we we're going to do, by the way. <laughs> so Get afterwards means uh, chronologically later. It's mm -hmm. purely time. It's just a time expression. Más tarde. 
No, uh, although Javi T didn't ask us, another thing which is often confused is afterwards and after. They are not interchangeable, although many native speakers also get it wrong. Uh, my example was, we had lunch. Afterwards, John went home. If you say after there, after John went home, that's wrong. Many native speakers would do that, but they're wrong, actually. You would have to say, after that, John went home. So you can't say afterwards plus a noun. You, yeah. You, you can say after the match, after the party, after, after the lunch, meeting, but you can't lunch. say afterwards the meeting. Exactly. Yeah. And um, another way of looking at it is with after, you must have a noun or a pronoun. Because it's after something. Yeah. You can't say after comma, John went home, uh, 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 wrong. It's afterwards, comma, John went home. Or after that, comma, or after lunch, or after we said goodbye, comma, John went home. After doesn't go on its own. Afterwards goes on its own. Um, grammar books argue about this, but afterwards, I would say, is an adverb, whereas after is a preposition. And because after is a preposition, it has to go with another word. That sounds clear to me. Uh, but you'll you'll hear native speakers uh, using after incorrectly. Mm -hmm. You'll hear it. Okay, moving on to another question from Javi T concerning whom, who, and whose. To whom it may concern, did to, you say, Craig? To whom, <laughs> to whom it may concern. <laughs> Which in this case is... Have it or who? When was the last time you wrote that in an email? To whom it may concern? Uh, uh, last week. <laughs> it, it was, really? Yes. In a formal letter, I'm thinking. Or an email. I, I write it in very formal email. I can't remember the last time I wrote that in an email. I had to write it because I was expecting a delivery of something. And you didn't know the name of the person you yeah. were writing to. And I don't have much connection with them. And I didn't even know which department to send it to. I didn't know. In that case, in a formal situation, it's good to write then, to whom it may concern. Mm -hmm. You're like saying, I don't know who I'm supposed to be writing it to, but I hope somebody reads it. Yeah, you don't know the name. Let's, let's leave whom uh, for now, because I think that the biggest problem is between whom and who. Because Javi's question is comparing whom, who, and whose with an S. And I think whose is easy to explain because whose is de quien? Whose is this mobile phone? Whose is this pen? Whose is this coffee? De quien? It's possessive. Yeah. yeah, that's fairly straightforward, fairly easy. I think the confusion is sometimes with who and whom. Mm -hmm. And your example from before, would you agree, Razor, that whom is not very common. It's mainly used in formal English, especially in written English. Yeah. And the expression to whom it may concern would be to somebody who you, you don't know and you're writing formally. Yes, yeah, definitely formal. But grammatic, grammatically speaking, when to use who and when to use whom? Because I think there is a mm -hmm. guide. Whom can only be for objects. It cannot be for subjects. The object of the sentence or yes. clause. Yeah. I mean, complemento, not objeto. Complemento. We're talking about grammar. Mm -hmm. It must be grammatically the object. For example, are you the gentleman whom I met earlier? Whom. Mm -hmm. Because the word whom in that sense is the object. I is the subject. Now, that was perfectly correct. But most people wouldn't say that. Most people would say, are you the gentleman who I met earlier? Yeah, because I think whom is being used less and less and less with time. It's not very common. Not common. It's correct, certainly is. But uh, you can use who as an object or a subject. Mm -hmm. Whereas whom is always for objects. So if I say whom do I love, I'm asking about the object of my affections. If I say I love a zombie... Yep. Then the zombie is the object, so yep. that's why I asked the question with whom. Yep. Whom do I love? Yes, but of course in modern English it would be much more common just to say who do I love. Mm -hmm. So who is for subjects or objects, and in modern English we tend to use who even when it's the object in most situations. 
Except when. There are times when the word whom is obligatory. For whom the bell tolls? To, <laughs> yes. to Hem- whom it may concern? Hemingway. When it's a fixed phrase no. or a title. No. To whom it may concern? You cannot say to who. That's wrong. Mm-hmm. Nobody, can say, nobody says that. Well, nobody with good English. To whom it may concern? For whom the bell's tolled? Can you see a connection between those? To whom? Blah, blah, blah. It's for whom? With a preposition. Ah, okay. With a preposition. When it's an indirect object. With a preposition. Right. For whom the bells toll. To whom it may concern. Uh, with whom are you going out tonight? Right. The word whom is obligatory. I repeat that. It's obligatory. With whom are you going out tonight? Is not very common. Mm-hmm. But in theory, it exists. <laughs> with, with whom. It is incorrect to say with who. Right. That is incorrect. What you can say is who. Are you going out with tonight? Ah, if you separate the word who and the preposition, then you don't write the M. No whom, no M, just who. For example, um, who are you going out with tonight? So who separated from with, then it's who. But, but if you put the preposition before, then it's you whom, must say whom. with whom. It's obligatory. But don't worry, because it's not very common. As Craig said, it's only really got stuck in a few fixed expressions, like to whom it may concern. Mm -hmm. And I think if you want to, an easy way to remember could be um, use whom with an M if the answer is him with an M. So both of those words finish in M. So or um, her, you could say, whom do you love? Now, if you can say, I love him, yes, and not, I love he, oh, okay. yeah, then it's whom. Mm-hmm. So that's a way to remember it. Um, if you can put him as the pronoun, mm-hmm. then it's whom. Yeah. We, we could talk more and more about this, but I think it would only confuse listeners. If, they're, me, not, if they're not confused already. <laughs> For me, the simplest way to remember it is simply this. In modern English... In modern English. Forget whom. <laughs> if no, 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 don't no, don't completely forget it. You won't see it a lot. But unless you're gonna put it beside a preposition, don't use it. But beside a preposition, yeah. It is still useful to know things like to whom it may concern. That is still used in formal written English. Yeah, it's a useful expression in a formal email. Yeah. And it would be incorrect if you wrote who. It must be whom. So Whom beside a preposition, to whom, for whom, by whom. Apart from that, you don't need it and best not to use it. But that expression, to whom it may concern, just learn that as a fixed phrase for an email in the same way that you would use, um, I'm looking forward to hearing from you or I look forward to your reply. So just use it as a fixed expression in your emails. You might occasionally get, get it in written English or even spoken English in a very formal context. Mm -hmm. For example, in a courtroom, yeah, a prosecutor asks the defendant, so to whom did you give the book, sir? Again, that's the preposition with the whom, so that makes sense. Because he's being formal, it's a court, it's a very formal legal proceeding. To whom did you give the book? But most of us would say, who did you give the book to? Right, that's more common but common English. I wouldn't be surprised to hear in a courtroom, for example, just that. To or, whom or in, did you give the Or book? in a legal contract, you'd yeah. see it as well. So thank you for that question, Javier. Well, Javier's final question, he asks about the verbs fancy and feel like. His question is, is it possible to use fancy and feel like as past verbs in the past tense? Yes. It is. I fancied... So the Y on fancy would change to I and you add ED to make the past simple tense. I fancied a pizza, so we went out for dinner. And the past of feel, it's irregular, is felt. So I felt like having a pizza. So the answer is yes. Both of those can be used in the, in the past and also in the future. Mm-hmm. 
We want to tell you about something we like on internet, italki.com. What is italki? Well, it's a place on the internet where you can find a personal one-to-one teacher at low cost. It's about 30% cheaper than an offline teacher. It's cheaper than a language school. It's also more convenient because you can do it when you want. You can get professional native speakers of English at a low cost. To find out about it, just go to englishpodcast.com slash italki. That's I-T-A-L-K-I, italki. What's more, italki are offering a special deal to listeners of Apprender Inglés con Resi Craig. They're offering 100 free italki credits, ITCs, when you sign up for their paid service. Buy 100, get 100 free. That's like one free lesson. Craig and I want to thank italki for sponsoring Apprender Inglés con Resi Craig because we think it's a very useful site for our listeners to improve their fluency in speaking. Thank you very much, uh, Javier, for your questions. And moving on to another question from a patron of the show, Armando. So thank you very much for supporting the show, Armando. And he says, hello, Reza, hello, Craig. I want to thank you for creating these podcasts every week i am from colombia oh thank and you. Uh, hi and i re- i recently became a patron to support your great labor thank you very your, much your great work maybe would be yes is, yeah better i really hope that many people can join us because together we can achieve the aim of having written transcriptions for every episode yes armando we are working on that i hope to find a solution very soon so keep listening and we'll make an announcement when we have a solution for the the written transcriptions of all the shows uh would you mind helping me with with this question i've been studying how to create questions with the following words how what which where when Question words. Question words. But I can't understand or identify the structure for these sentences. And when I need to use the auxiliary verbs do, does, did, have, has, etc. He says, I know know the auxiliary do is for I, we, you, they, in the present simple, and does for he, she, it. Mm -hmm. But it's not clear for me when I need to put the auxiliary in the question and when not to... So he's given some examples here. He sounds quite confused. When does he use the um, auxiliary verbs? What time do you usually have breakfast? How many people live in this house? Why does this not have an auxiliary verb? How much is this bunch of white roses? How often do you visit your parents, etc.? So he's given a list of questions. His basic question, I think, is when to use auxiliary verbs Mm -hmm. and when not to. There is a rule. Tell us. It's grammar. Um, The simplest and therefore the best way is this. If the question word, who, when, how much, why, where, uh, where, what time, etc. If the question word is an object, then use the normal question form with an auxiliary. Can you repeat that? If the question word is an object is an object, use the question form. You learn in your early years of English that there's the positive form, the negative form, and the question form. For example, um, I eat rice, positive. I don't eat rice, negative. Do I eat rice? The do, the question form, yep. You learn that's the question form, yeah. And then you discover, as Armando's discovered, that actually you don't always use the question form for a question. That's right. The example he gives is um, how many people live in this house. There's no auxiliary verb. And there's no auxiliary because how many is the subject, not the object. If the question word, grammatically, grammatically, is an object, and usually it is, then use the question form. For example, who did you help? I helped John. Yeah. So you are the subject. You helped John. John is the object. So who object did you subject help? Who is the object? Who did you help? Auxiliary did. However, think about this. Who helped you? There's no auxiliary. 
who helped you mm -hmm. because who helped you who is the subject and now you is the object right that's the rule could you give one or two more examples yep how many eggs did you buy auxiliary verb how many eggs did you buy because you bought the eggs you're the subject and eggs there are how many eggs we've got the question word plus another word how many eggs that's the object so with auxiliary how many eggs did you buy yeah and an, exam what, an example without how many cars arrived no auxiliary because how many cars is the subject okay arrived no did that's clear it's as simple as that Mm -hmm. And it's the same rule for all question words. Who, how many, how much, where, what time, etc. I'll give you a couple of more. more. Um, well, is, there's an example here from Armando. H whose car is this? De quién es este coche? Whose car? Well, it's, no, that's not a good example. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a good example because it's the verb to be, which never uses an auxiliary verb. Right, of course, because it's yeah. is. Whose car is this? The verb to be, no auxiliary verb. So remember, Amanda, the verb to be never has auxiliary. Oh, okay. so, no, so that's something we should no stress, problem. that if the if you're using any any form of the verb to be, there's no auxiliary verb. Needed for a question. For yeah. a question. Another example, how long ago did my mother arrive? Mm -hmm. because auxiliary verb did. Yep, yeah, because my mother is the subject. My mother arrived. So if you've already got a subject, my mother, then the question word, how long ago, can't be the subject. Because mm -hmm. as a clause or a, or a short sentence can only have one subject. So if my mother is the subject, then the question words, how long ago, cannot be the subject. Therefore, must be the object, auxiliary. Another example, where do you work? You is the subject of the question. Yeah. Auxiliary verb. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and finally, um, he doesn't understand why the sentences use the verb likes with an S instead of like without an S. So the third person S in an in a, a f affirmative statement, he likes chocolate. Obviously, you have the S because it's he. So with he, she, and it. Could we say Craig likes chocolate? You can say Craig likes chocolate. He does. It's, st <laughs> it's still third person. But when you ask the question, does Craig like chocolate, just think that the S from the verb jumps to the do. Yep. So there's, then, there's an S, but it's not on the verb because of the auxiliary verb does. Does Craig like chocolate? Does Reza like yep. steak? Yeah. Oh, oh, and another way to remember is the auxiliary verbs do, does, uh, don't are followed by infinitive without two. Yes. So no S, infinitive. So does like, do eat, don't like, don't eat, no S. Thank you for your question, Armando. Very interesting. Now we have uh, a voice message from Isabel from Brazil. Here's Isabel. Hi, I'm Isabela from Brazil and I'd like to ask you a question about the pronouns I and me. Is it correct I say you and me or is it preferable I say you and I? Thanks. So, Isabel's question, you and I or you and me? That's an interesting one. Craig, shall you answer that question or shall I? I think uh, we'll start with you. <laughs> me. Okay. <laughs> or shall I? Me? Shall we start with me? Shall we start with I? Shall we start with me? Shall we shall start, we start with, We'll start with you. Yeah. With me. <laughs> with you. Not I. You, you, you and I together, or okay. is it you and me together? Ah, well, that's ah. the question, isn't it? That's the question. I is a subject pronoun, and me is an object pronoun. Always? Um, generally speaking. Mm, are you? The, the, correct, the correct sentence is, I love you, not me love you. Yep. 
So I is always a subject, yeah? Mm -hmm. But is me always an object? She loves me. It's an object, right? Mm -hmm. But you and me do the podcast together. Is that not good English? We're both subjects in that example. If I say Reza and I love podcasting. Uh -huh. Can you not say Reza and me love podcasting? No. Really? No, don't think so. Oh, you're very old-fashioned, Craig. I never realized you were so old-fashioned. I agree with you that we may have been taught at school, Reza and I. Because we're both the subjects of the clause. We both love podcasting. Nos dos. Craig, would you have the nerve to go into your... I know it's been a long time ago, but what was once your local pub in London many, many years ago? Yeah. Uh, imagine I went with you, right? Um, just uh, like, give me a bit of time to explain the situation. So Craig has gone to his local pub. He's brought me with him. His old mates are there, but they don't know me. And they say, Craig, you and your friend must have a drink. Craig, are you telling me you, you would say, well, Reza and I will have a pint of lager. Would you really say that? Reza and I? Wouldn't, wouldn't you say Reza and me? I might say Reza, I might say Reza and me, but... According to the grammar books, yes. it will be correct to say Razor and I because we are both the subjects in the clause. Can't we say that they're both correct and accept both of them? I agree. Let's say that they're both correct, although maybe in formal written English, mm. Razor and I would be more acceptable. Yeah. Yeah. But I don't think you'll hear it spoken very often these days. Mm -hmm. When people speak using informal English, when the subject is you and I, they usually say you and me, even though you and I is more correct, mm -hmm. you and me has become accepted as okay. Yeah, yeah. Especially with fixed expressions like between you and me. I mean, you wouldn't say between you and I. Uh -huh. Well, I would go so far as to say it's wrong to say between you and I. Yeah, Because too. if there's a preposition... Yeah. Then you must say me. It's those prepositions again. Although there are people who say between you and I, but I believe they're wrong. Mm. They say it, but they're wrong, in fact. Because me is the object form, direct or indirect. So with a preposition, you've got to use the object form. So clearly, Isabel, there are situations where it's wrong to use me um, when it's clearly the subject of the verb. For example, I like um, this podcast. You wouldn't say me like this podcast. You'd sound like Tarzan. Yeah. But um, when speaking about um, a razor and I or razor and me, it's sometimes acceptable. Uh, it's often acceptable to interchange and use both, mm -hmm. remembering that uh, you and I or him and I, razor and I, would probably be more grammatically uh, um, correct in formal English. Do you agree with that? Yeah. Okay. Thank you for your, for your question, and we're very happy to have uh, listeners in Brazil. Very excited. And uh, we have a final comment from Julio Alejandro Pinzon Nunez from Tunja, I think, in Colombia. So, hello, uh, Julio. Hello. It's nice to have listeners in Colombia also. Uh, Julio says, Gracias por las lecciones. He aprendido mucho. He aclarado muchas dudas. Thank you very much. Acabo de escuchar el episodio 3. Wow. <laughs> episodio 3. Y aquí en Colombia utilizamos el verbo colocar como sinónimo de poner. Por ejemplo, póngase en la fila. Colócase en la fila. They don't say that in, in Spanish, no. in Spain, do they? No, not in Spain. Yeah. So... Um, Colócase en la, en la fila o haga o también coloca el libro en la mesa. Haga, haga el libro en la mesa. Would they say that in Colombia? Or, or in Spain, no. In Colombia, yeah. In Colombia, yeah. Coloca el libro en la mesa, which, uh, which will be put the book on the table. So we'd, we'd say put, wouldn't we? Yeah. And how would you say póngase, what was it? Póngase, Pong, en, póngase fil en la fila. Put, put yourself in the queue. Or, I'd say or get in queue. Get in the queue. Get in, the queue. Or, or or get in line. Get in line, get in line is, line is more maybe queue. American. Get mm. in line, get in the queue or queue up. Queue up, phrasal verb, yeah. Phrasal verb, to queue up. Colócase en la fila. Thank you for that comment, uh, Julio. 
And that's all we have time for on this episode. So thank you to all of you who are listening and supporting us. You remember, you can send us your questions and comments by email to craig at inglespodcast.com or belfastreza at gmail.com. On our website at inglespodcast.com, you can find a contact form to, to write to us and also a place to record your voice, practice your speaking and send us a sound file for the comment or question. Thank you again for listening, and until next time, it's a huge goodbye from me. And a goodbye from me. Just a normal one. Just a normal one. <laughs> Thank you for listening. <laughs> the music in this podcast is by Pitts. The track is called See You Later. <laughs> <laughs>